Welcome to the podcast and video ministry of Rosemark First Presbyterian Church. Let us begin our service today with a call to worship. Listen for the Word of God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Let us worship God. I invite you now, if you will, to join with me in our morning prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we praise you this day that you are a God of truth who has given us your eternal word to teach and guide us through the challenges, mysteries, and perils of this world. We praise you this day that you are a God of comfort and mercy, who knows our failures and our tragedies, who is familiar with our pain and suffering, and who yearns to make us whole. We praise you this day that you are a God of peace who knows the conflicts we face, who is familiar with the wounds we endure, and who wants to shelter us from harm. Especially do we praise you this day that you are a God of providence, who can redeem our failures, transform our defeats, and overcome our mistakes. So we offer you our heartfelt thanksgiving that you are at work in and through our lives. Especially are we thankful for the grace of justification that cancels our sins, the grace of sanctification that develops our righteousness, and the grace of salvation that secures our eternal destiny. We confess before you that we fall far short of your hopes and dreams for us. So we pray that even now your Holy Spirit would be at work in and through us. Help us to love you, our God, with all our heart, soul, and might. Help us to love our neighbors, even as we love ourselves. We pray especially today for all those whom the current pandemic has meant the loss of jobs and income. We pray for all those who have suffered from hunger and want. Even as you fed your chosen people in the wilderness, so we pray that you would feed all those in our own country and around the world who struggle with finding nourishment during a time of food insecurity. We pray for peace in Afghanistan, Armenia, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. We ask for your protective might to shield the children endangered by cruel and unceasing war. All this we ask in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to read to you Today, our two scripture lessons, the first from the 25th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, verses 1 to 9, and the second scripture reading from the letter to the Philippians, verses 1 to 7. Listen for the word of God. Listen first for the word of God as I read our scripture from the book of the prophet Isaiah. I am reading verse chapter 25, 
verses 1 to 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat, when the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Here ends our reading from the book of the prophet. Turning now to Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, I'm reading from the fourth chapter, verses 1 to 7. Listen again for the word of God. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Here ends our reading from God's holy word. To God's name be the glory and the praise. I want to share with you today on the topic, the God of peace, the God of peace. And I'm brought to my topic by two verses in particular. First, the... uh, seventh verse of the 25th chapter of Isaiah. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And secondly, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is from the seventh verse of Philippians, the fourth chapter. Before I plunge into my message, uh, I want to share with you uh, two uh, insights that uh, a a substitute for my 
usually diligent research team has, has come up with this week. And the first of these is the attempt of a church member to understand a pastor, a very worthy uh, exercise. A woman who lived next door to a preacher was curious about the dramatic change in his personality every Sunday. At home, he was shy and retiring, a very quiet individual. At church, he was on fire with enthusiasm, a very excited preacher. So one day, she just asked him, asked him to explain. Ah, he answered, what you see on Sunday is my alter ego. <laughs> Think about that and you'll get it. <laughs> the second is a conversation that a lady named Jamie had with God. You know, all of us from time to time have conversations with God. And, and here, here goes one uh, that, that I found. God, this is Jamie talking, okay. God, how long is a million years to you? God, it is but a second to me, Jamie. Jamie, God, how much is a million dollars to you? God, it is but a penny, Jamie. Jamie, God, could I have a penny? God, just a second. <laughs> I love that. I love that. The God of peace. The God of peace. The great 19th century American poet and hymn writer, John Greenleaf Whittier, once wrote in a prayerful hymn, drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace the beauty of thy peace. The authors of the New Testament title that is taken from our scripture, God of Peace, use that phrase numerous times. I checked and in every case, the word in the original language used for peace uh, in each of these passages is identically the same. The Apostle Paul used it in a prayerful benediction at the end of chapter 15 in his epistle to the Romans. He wrote, The God of peace be with you all. Amen. Paul used it again in a hopeful prophecy in chapter 16, also in his epistle to the Romans. He wrote, The God of peace will shortly crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The apostle used it a third time in his epistle to the Corinthians, and this time he built a striking contrast. He wrote, For God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. Paul used it a fourth time in his second epistle to the Corinthians, but this time he incorporated the concept of love alongside the concept of peace. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. In the conclusion of his very early work, the first epistle to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul incorporates the phrase, in an exhortation and encouragement that he offered to the Christians in that church. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In a famous benediction, the author of Hebrews wrote, Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among you that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, God of peace occurred twice in Romans, once each in the letters to the Corinthians, once in 1 Thessalonians and once in Hebrews. So this is not a word choice of merely stylistic or antiquarian interest. For the biblical writers, this form of reference and address is deliberate and significant. What is crucial for us to realize involves the relationship between the two terms, God and peace. With regard to that relationship, that connection, peace does not so much validate God as the opposite. God creates, validates, and justifies peace. Almighty God gives and continues to give peace its substance, its meaning, and significance. Peace is so crucially important to God that God incorporates peace as part of her identity, as a crucial component of her being, as a signifier of divine righteousness. Peace functions as a sign of the presence and the transforming power of Almighty God. The Apostle Paul understood the spiritual dynamics involved when he wrote to the Romans, therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. The Italian Pope, Paul VI, who was canonized by Pope Francis in 2018, once wrote about the biblically-based ministry of reconciliation or peacemaking. A love of reconciliation, he wrote, a love of reconciliation is not weakness or cowardice. It demands courage, nobility, generosity, sometimes heroism, and overcoming of oneself rather than one's adversary. At times, it may even seem like dishonor, but it never offends against true justice or denies the rights of the poor. In reality, it is the patient, wise art of peace, of loving, of living with one's fellows after the example of Christ with a strength of heart and mind modeled on his. Reconcilers are peacemakers. In his second epistle to the Corinthians, Paul insisted, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our Lord Jesus Christ encouraged these spiritual dynamics when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. The great American poet Walt Whitman once said succinctly, where there is peace, God is. Where there is peace, God is. So what does the scripture tell us? 
Peace is a part of who God is. Peace is what God wants. Peace brings God joy. Peacemakers are those whom God calls, God blesses, and God empowers. Wherever and whenever we pray for peace, work for peace, and commit to peace, we are honoring God's identity and we are participating in and sharing in God's joy. Our readings and our quotations from the scriptures this morning invite us and challenge us to know the joy of serving the God of peace. The church needs to be a beachhead for the invasion of God's peace. The church needs to be a model of the kind of community that tolerates, accepts, and welcomes wounded veterans from every kind of conflict. The church needs to be reconciled and reconciling with a positive message for a broken and hurting world. Why? Because God wants that for us and even created us for exactly that ministry. In our New Testament reading from the epistle to the Philippians, the apostle Paul began by urging two women in his favorite church to be reconciled. There are no details about how or why they fell out with one another. However, the apostle would not have urged them to be of the same mind in the Lord unless there had been some form of disagreement. The beginning of the letter offered some important insights about reconciliation in the church that still hold true today. First, it does not seem to have been the case that one of the two was definitely and overwhelmingly in the right, while the other was simply dead wrong. Paul wrote that both women had struggled beside him in the work of the gospel. Moreover, they both seem to have had equal status with all those in the church who shared the church's work. The apostle also wrote that they had worked alongside the rest of the co-workers for the furtherance of the gospel in a way that was remarkable in the patriarchal environment of the ancient world, nothing was said about the two women having inferior status because they were women. Nothing was said about their being unworthy because they were just women, after all. They both had status. They both had worth. And they both had value as Christian co-workers. Second, it is fascinating to observe how the Apostle Paul was mobilizing the entire church to help the two reconcile. Even in his favorite congregation, the first he founded in Europe, Paul seems to be saying that divisiveness is destructiveness. Divisiveness is destructiveness. He insisted that the division be both addressed and overcome. He put a priority on peaceful reconciliation. Third, the exhortation that followed was something more than just general encouragement. He urged the congregation to focus upon the joy of the Lord. He urged the congregation to be gentle and forbearing. He reminded the congregation that the Lord was near. The Lord was near, which may have been a way of saying that the second coming of Christ would soon replace the world they knew with the kingdom of God in the world to come. Paul also encouraged the Philippian Christians to avoid worry. The solution to that problem would be to seek 
God's help in prayer. Their prayers should consist of supplication with thanksgiving. And then Paul promised the congregation that, quote, the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Inspired and inscribed in God's word by the God of peace was, quote, a prescription for peace and a, quote, recipe for reconciliation. And here is that recipe. First, respect the contributions of all those at odds with each other. Second, rejoice in the Lord and the Lord's goodness always and at all times. Third, resist being harsh and unforgiving in attitudes and actions. Fourth, remember that both the Lord and the world to come are nearby. Fifth, rely on prayer and thanksgiving in order to overcome worry. And sixth, rest your confidence in how Jesus protects our hearts and minds. That's so important. I want to repeat it one more time. A recipe for reconciliation. One, respect the contributions of all those at odds with each other. Two, rejoice in the Lord and the Lord's goodness always and at all times. Three, resist being harsh and unforgiving in both your attitudes and your actions. Four, remember that both the Lord and the world to come are nearby. Five, rely on prayer and thanksgiving in order to overcome worry. And six, rest your confidence in how Jesus protects our hearts and minds. Two of the greatest blessings we could ever hope to have are to know the God of peace and to know the peace of God. Isaiah prophesied, this is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. To God be the glory and the praise.